Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today we look at art from Africa, an unusual musical instrument and a project aiming at safeguarding Syrian heritage. An artist takes a world commodity and challenges its real value on canvas. Artist Janan Tolon's most comprehensive solo exhibition comes to Istanbul Modern. The magic of shapes, light and reflections. We take a look at one artist's enchanting installations. The first week of October is an exciting and overwhelming time in London's cultural calendar, with dozens of art events popping up around the town. But the spotlight shines on Freeze. The 17th edition of the Art Fair is its most international edition to date, with 160 participating galleries from 36 different countries. Political reflections take over this year's works, from Grayson Perry's politically charged ceramics and tapestries to Sterling Ruby's installation about the violence and pressures within society. A new section called Woven is spotlighting textile and weaving art. Yet another novelty is a dedicated space for performance art. But Freeze isn't the only art fair in British capital this week. The first leading international art fair dedicated to contemporary art from Africa, 154, returns for its seventh edition at Somerset House until the end of this week. The fair has expanded this year, welcoming 45 international galleries, but it still focuses on emerging artists, as it does every year, and pays special attention to the galleries exhibited at the fair for the first time. To talk more about Freeze London, let's bring in Jean Wainwright. She is a professor of contemporary art and photography at UCA. Jean, welcome back to Showcase. It's great to have you again on our show. So, you were at Freeze London. Thank you. And as far as what I've read, yes. textile has taken over the space this year. I mean, uh, can we safely say that it's making a comeback, textile? Well, that's a great question to start with. There is a section this year woven that has um, eight presentations of textile artists. And there's, there's a lot of presence in the fair itself of textiles. And it seems to be, of course, that not only were textiles marginalized for a very long time, but also in this fair, they're trying to talk about colonialism, they're trying to talk about histories. And I think, you know, these are conversations that need to be had, but also the work is very stunning and so different. So I think that's one important thing. Secondly, I think, you know, with young people and all kinds of people now, we are very wedded to our screens and textiles are one way, the thread, the sewing, those kind of things are so tactile. And I think that's also made a difference to how this medium is, is being responded to. But certainly the section gives both a historic overview, if you like, of, of artists of very different ages, from very different places, but also showing some more very younger contemporary artists when it shows the wealth of what textiles can be. I mean, just like you said, textile art was marginalized for a long time. Of course, that was found non-European or it was seen as a craft but it was seen as women's practice, most of all. So I wonder if you see any feminist discourse come at play in Freeze this year. Again, that's a really interesting question. For the last two years, there's been presentations of, of women artists at the fair in that particular section. But yes, there is feminist dialogues coming through the work itself, but I think in a sense as well, this very work was about being marginalized. So often there were political works made, and I think that really comes across that these are beautiful, sometimes private works, sometimes works done in conjunction with other people that make expressions that are important to have dialogues, but this is this is not a new thing. I think what is what is great and new is that this work is now being collected. This work is now 
being in, people are interested in it. They're seeing it as fine art, whereas before it was much more regarded as craft. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a change over the past years, Jean. Um, you mentioned digital, the dig digital age we live in, but we're not seeing a lot of new media or video art installations in this freeze, right? That's a, another great question as well. Yeah, I mean, you would think that the fair would be full of screens and digital art. It's not. There are some really interesting digital works in it. But I think, A, showing digital art in fairs is problematic. Getting very dark spaces, for example, or indeed getting people to stop and interact with things to put on headphones or, you know, those kind of things very much uh, connected with new media. But there are two phenomenons here that I want to talk about. One is um, we have got some of the leading people, uh, Mark Lecky, we've got showing uh, work there. We've got Hito showing work. So we have got digital art, but also we've got a huge sense of this work going out into the digital world. So even though there might not be many expressions of digital screens, um, everybody there is taking pictures. Everybody is posing in front of their favorite works. So in a way, this work is going out into the digital arena. And although we don't have um, a huge presentation of digital films, as I said, but what we do have is a presence of this being a fair that is certainly going out there in the digital airways and galleries that are putting on um, online digital rooms. So you can view their work both inside and outside the fair. I mean, Jean, you mentioning the audience uh, brings me to this question. I mean, Freeze London is, of, of course, a trade fair, but um, it is aiming at general public as well. And the entr entry fees are quite high and you don't really have price tags on the artwork. So I have to ask this question to you. Do you think it's just a playground for the rich Freeze Art Fair? I love that question. Uh, one reason is uh, because Grayson Perry, of course, um, has uh, made a wonderful actual tapestry in, in, the, um, in the show, which is all about elitism. Um, this tapestry that has in it all these sayings, all these threads about, you know, elitism, about yoga, about private tutoring, about exploiting, which is absolutely poking fun at the rich, the very audience, you might say, that come in on the first pre days. But... My second point is, yes, it is expensive. And is it, is it elite? Well, of course it is. I mean, even to be in the fair as a, as a gallery, you have to have a great deal of money and support behind you. Of course, there are booths that are um, subsidized in special projects. But first of all, it does have that. Of course it does. Um, it is a commercial fair, um, but they do want the public to come and it is expensive. And when you ask why is it so expensive, things are mentioned like cost, maintenance, uh, how, you, how you put on a fair like this, the huge prices of shipping, all these different things, of course, connected with any global exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, the elitism perhaps um, can be disseminated slightly by being able to see things online. But if you do pay the entrance fee, if you do go there, you do see wonderful presentations. You do see the actual art, you engage with it. And you also are able to see how these booths are curated and the stories they're telling and see also what are the trends? What is happening in the art world? Mm -hmm. um, what are artists making now? Of course. Well, Freeze London, of course, very important for the art world. Jean Wei, right? Great to have you as always. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's turn to the main satellite of Freeze London 154 Art Fair. The founding director, Toria El Glaoui, joins me there in London. Thanks for being with us today, Toria. So, it's almost tempting for me to think that you deliberately timetabled your fair to coincide with Freeze Art Fair that is happening like 10 minutes away from you. Is that it? Yes, uh, when we started in 2013, we chose deliberately to uh, 
uh, you know, choose the same data as freeze and leverage on, you know, the main collectors and uh, art lovers and art producers that were in town for one for freeze. Um, so we were quite new and we wanted to be part of the, you know, the circuit of Freeze Week. And it was definitely a, a, a thought through choice. And seems like it worked, didn't it? Yes, so we're able to leverage on different, uh, you know, at different levels. So we're able to leverage on all the collectors in town who are curious and are coming to us. So the fair is attracting, you know, 18,000 visitors. And I think being a satellite fair of freeze really helped us, you know, create a 154 brand, but also the visibility we wanted for the artists. Uh, I think you're the perfect person to ask this question to. Is there such a thing as African art? Because obviously the criticism against this this uh, title was raised many times before because obviously we're talking about 54 different countries with different sociopolitical backgrounds, but you're still willingly, intentionally using the term. Why? So uh, we first tried to, you know, use a title for the show called 154. So actually under the, underneath this, so one for the continent, 54 for the number of countries. I feel, I feel that for any artist, it's really diminishing to be categorized. But when I started in 2013, the question was not about, you know, uh, if it was good or not good for the artist. It was more to create a platform and to respond of a lack of, um, of uh, basically a necessity. There was absolutely no platform giving visibility to artists coming from the continent and the African diaspora. So um, I'm sure, you know, that in the long term and obviously for the artists, um, they would prefer to be considered as artists. But um, the mission of 154 was to create a voice for artists coming from the continent and um, artists coming from the African diaspora. And I think this is what we have to focus on is the fact that we created a platform that provide access to uh, those artists which did not, um, uh, did not exist before. And, um, I mean, you aim to change the dialogue around African art and Africanness in that sense uh, with your fair. So let me ask you this. Do you think your fair is a political act? Well, um, we do, uh, you know, have artists obviously really um, uh, impacting, uh, impacted by their, uh, you know, life context. Um, and sometimes, you know, that can, you know, be about, you know, political issues. I think that, you know, the, the first mission, as I said, of 154 was not about a political art of any kind. It was just um, a question of offering visibility that was well, you know, required for those artists to be able to develop their craft, to be part of the, glo the global stage and to, to be, uh, you know, part of the, 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 the narrative of contemporary art, which they were not before. I mean, if this is called a political act, then you know, we are doing a political act, but I think that we are just, you know, trying to give access to this artist uh, to the world, you know, which is um, more that, um, you know, about, you know, showcasing, you know, the, 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 the fantastic work they do. And uh, I think that, you know, if the success of 154 has continued to grow, it's because um, the, the, the content and the talent is there mm -hmm. and they just needed the visibility that, you know, was not uh, giving to them. I mean, speaking of the success of 154, many people are saying that there is a bit of a, like a boom in African art scene at the moment. But then when I look at, for example, Freeze London that is happening at the moment, out of the 160 international art galleries exhibiting there at the moment, only two of them are from Africa. So help me understand this, Taria. Is there actually a boom in African art? Well, there's definitely a, a, a great appreciation at the moment. Um, but there's, obviously there's definitely not, a, you know, a full inclusion of galleries in all those international art fairs. And this is why, you know, we thought it was a necessity to create 154 because it responded, you know, to really a lack of um, platforms. Uh, including uh, contemporary African artists. And um, it, the, the example you just quoted, you know, of having only two African galleries at Freeze is one of the reasons we created 154. And before we created 154, those two galleries were not even there. So um, I think there's definitely a progress. That means that with the appreciation and the visibility we were able to create now, you know, Freeze and other art fairs, you know, internationally 
are you know more uh, inclusive or you know are 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 keen to look into you know including our, uh, galleries from the African continent, but those numbers are extremely small. And I mean, you you chose the example of galleries coming from the continent, but if you had counted the number of artists that freeze coming from the African continent, you would have been surprised, you know, as well. Good to have you on our show. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have, Taria Al Glawi. Okay, thank you for having me. Thank you. Oil is a massive global industry that dominates world economics and politics. War is our photo over it. But in this instance, a Russian artist is using it as the medium in large-scale paintings to reveal what he calls the myths of oil. For 10 years, famous Moscow artist Nikolai Nasetkin has been jeopardizing his health to tell this story. Vivid dark textures and total black compositions. The artworks by Nikolai Nasedkin are made with wide strokes and focused on the material itself, crude oil. The Russian artist uses not only paint, but oil in his creations. For our country, it is bringing both wealth and power. And for us, for the people at the same time. This oil does not reach us. You can see large-scale paintings as well as art objects and videos from the artist's hometown village, where he found a huge scale of inspiration for his works. My birthplace is the village of Aleshki. You can see it on the drawing. I come from there, from Voronezh area. And you can see that the topic of relatives is present here. And it's also very important. The exhibition supervisor describes the Setkin's artworks as an attempt to show modern Russia and portray the significance of oil through history, despite the side effects on the artist's health. This is an exceptional case. The artist is working with crude oil as a painter. Sometimes he is risking his life. The vapors from the suspensions have negative health effects, and he is trying to depict the general categories with that material, family and kin. The exhibition can be seen until November the 11th in Moscow's new Tretyakov Gallery. Stewards of Cultural Heritage. It's a project that came about in 2016 with the sole purpose of safeguarding Syrian heritage in tatters since the war began. Organized by the German Archaeological Institute in Istanbul, the project has since received the Europa Nostra Awards, the highest honor in the field of cultural heritage. Now to complement it, a new exhibition of archival photographs has just opened. Showcase Sena Arslan went to check it out. The destruction of war is depicted on the news. Pictures of refugees enduring great hardships. It's a constant bombardment in itself. Sometimes I can't help but think that such depictions are dangerous. In a way, they are normalizing the whole situation, creating indifference and emotional distance. The photos in this exhibition, however, are not like that. They were all selected based on the pre-war memories of Syrian refugees in Turkey. Opened at the Rezan Has Museum, just by the Golden Horn in Istanbul, this exhibition is titled A Place and a Story. Nine Syrian cities have been picked to chronicle the daily life in Syria from the late 1890s up until 2009, just before the war. The photographs are from the archives of the Museum of Islamic Art in Berlin and the German Archaeological Institute. An archivist at the Institute's Istanbul office, Berna Polat is one of the members of the curatorial team. What she tells me here is the story behind one of the pictures from the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. 
The story of this picture came from Said, a 26-year-old student who lives in Izmir now. Apparently, Said's aunt once brought five kilograms of bird food to the Umayyad Mosque and prayed for her daughter to heal, as the Syrian tradition goes. And she couldn't carry the load, so Said's father brought her here by car. It took us some time to find this picture of the courtyard with pigeons to complement this story. Polat thinks this element of empathy is crucial, especially today. She says her opinions about the Syrian refugees have been changed while creating this project. Nowadays, when you say Idlib or Raqqa in Turkey, Daesh immediately comes to mind. But there is a huge cultural heritage in these cities. For instance, 23-year-old Omar from Idlib told us about the archaeological discoveries in his hometown during his childhood. He said he remembers the day this mosaic was found and added, Idlib is sitting on a sea of archaeology. When we think of archival material, however, we often think of them as past instances, which are now mute and detached, as if they belong to another realm. Once they are combined with personal stories, like in this exhibition, and put a human face on, they turn into powerful, transformative tools of narrative. The photographs here, you find them in Berlin, I mean the photos of Syria, and exhibit them in Turkey. This is an amazing map, isn't it? It means this, archives are public, they belong to all of us. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. Istanbul Modern is hosting the most comprehensive exhibit of artist Jan Antolon's abstract work ever held. Spanning four decades, her prints, paintings and sculptures largely focus on the myriad ways humans have impacted, for better or for worse, on the Earth's natural environments. Showcases Adil Halim went to see. Splitting her time between Turkey and the United States, Janan Tolan has returned to her birth country for a career retrospective. And with more than 40 years of work to exhibit, both originals and recreations, it's no surprise the artist's work covers two floors at Istanbul Modern. And while Tolon's unique pieces are meant to spark dialogue, don't expect the artist to lead the discussion. I don't like talking about my work. It's very hard. I talk through my art, what I cannot say myself. That's why it's hard to talk about them. I prefer to say it directly through art. When I named the exhibition You Tell Me, it wasn't a challenge, but I wanted to say that I listen rather than talk. This piece comes from 1989. The title of the piece is Topographer. While she clearly shies away from speaking about her work, there's no shortage of others who do, as well as those willing to heap praise on Tolon. With her intellectual background, variety of research she has conducted, and search for one-of-a-kind materials and techniques, John Antolon is, without a doubt, one of the most interesting and creative artists of her generation. You Tell Me is a cross-section of Janan Tolan's artwork from the 1980s to present day, reflecting on the chaos, struggle, and uncertainty created by humans transforming nature. There are two main concepts in her work, nature and architecture. We look at the relationship between the two, how they repel or attract each other, as well as ask what nature tells, with the tension that stems from this relationship. We also look at the position of man in this transformation, as it is man which transforms nature the most. Tolon's experimental work ranges from drawings to photographs and from paintings to installations. Much of it has to do with creating illusions of nature, some with mirrors, leaving the audience to decide what's real and what's not. Much of her art focuses on nature's continual renewal, even incorporating grass seeds and water in her paintings. Architecture is another major recurring theme in Tolon's artwork. Architecture is one of the most important instruments of human domination over nature. 
and its power to transform it. Therefore, the connection between nature and architecture is not a connection that can be easily rationalized. They both give to and take away from each other. This is a loop. I think, in all her works, Tolon looks at how this loop functions and points to our failure against nature we are trying to rule over. Chalakolu wants audiences to be active participants when they're walking through the exhibition. He hopes that by putting architectural spaces in direct conflict with natural elements, Tolon's pieces will make people rethink their relationship with both nature and the environment. Adil Halim, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.